My name is Sue Ann Ware and I'm the Head of School of Architecture and Built Environment at the University of Newcastle. We respectably, we respected, <laughs> no, I knew it was going to happen. We respectably acknowledge the traditional custodians, the Awabakal and the Wurramai people, whose traditional land the University of Newcastle and Newcastle City Council resides on. We acknowledge Aboriginal elders and leaders, past, present and future, and understand that sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. This is particularly salient in the architecture and the built environment. In my school, SABI, which we like to call it, we recognise that we work on country and that it's contested ground and that our jobs are to address dispossession and produce graduates and staff who will make a difference. I want to welcome and thank all of you for coming tonight. As you know, we've been in a really interesting situation with lockdowns and online learning and everything happening online. This is one of the first public face-to-face -face events the university's been able to hold in terms of the Looking Ahead lecture series. In 2020, we had a great lineup, and I'm going to give you a little bit of reflection on that. Um, we talked about you know, communities and how we as a university want to be more outward facing. We want you to have access to our expertise to bring together fantastic panels like tonight. And, and really, what are, the, what are the things that matter? So we've had lots of looking ahead lectures looking at things like climate change, looking at Black Lives Matter still, and particularly today that's incredibly salient, as well as um, what I would call resilience across a range of endeavors. And tonight you will be hearing not just resilience in the built environment or maybe around disasters, but around psychological resilience, what it means individually, what it means in a community sense, what it means at a state level, what it might mean at a global level. So this lecture series is really, really special. And it's really a about the university and, and the city and our community coming together and sharing knowledge. So we hope we get lots of really great questions. And, and we really hope that this idea of resilience is unpacked and sort of turned on its head. And, and there's lots of different ways in which the panel and the audience can work through that. As always, our panels are quite diverse. I'm going to just introduce now Willow Forsyth, who is uh, currently a PhD student in the School of Architecture and Built Environment. Her research examines household flood preparedness and focuses on improving information available to emergency managers to tailor educational approaches, which is really, really important. She's an experienced consultant and technical writer for strategic reviews of re resilience infrastructure. I'd like you to please welcome Willow. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm Willow Forsyth, as you've heard, and I am a PhD student at the um, University of Newcastle. My task tonight in seven minutes is threefold, so you can check if I make the seven minutes. Um, I need to, I want to tell you why I first got interested in disaster resilience as a concept. I want to tell you a little bit about my PhD and I will not go on for 20 minutes. And I most importantly need to introduce Commissioner Fitzsimmons. So as to the first, my interest and belief in this idea of building um, disaster resilient communities, it actually grew out of a coincidence of roles when I was studying for my masters at the University of Newcastle. So I'm a member of my local surf club in Stockton. And as a Nippers age manager and also as the bronze trainer in the club, I actually saw firsthand what is the impact of a shift in our communities that we may not have thought about. So decades ago, Nipper parents were generally local residents who really knew the surf, and they were the ones who were actively teaching their children about it. Today, for those of us who are involved in this sort of a volunteer activity, we've noticed that many of the parents of Nippers, they don't know the surf, they haven't grown up in it, and therefore their children don't know the surf either. Consequently, most of our Nipper parents and the kids, they're just, they're just not aware that flash rap rips can happen out of the blue. They have little confidence of what they might do if something slips sideways, um, and they don't actually have the skill to either rescue themselves or others. So when you step back from all of that and you think about across all of our suburbs, people like coming to the beach. 
but for many of them, it's actually an incredibly unfamiliar environment. They can't read the surf conditions, and so they do two things. They underestimate the risk, and they overestimate their abilities. And those are the factors that contribute to accidents and to fatalities. There is no longer in our society, in our communities, a dominant generational passing down of surf knowledge and skills. Without the active education roles of many of our surf clubs, we actually risk losing what I'd like to call surf resilience within our communities. It's our volunteers in surf clubs today that must understand and work to address that gap. So to the second, how does that little piece relate at all to my PhD? Well, extreme floods are rare events. They seemingly happen out of the blue. Our experience or intuition tells us they're far more likely to happen to someone else other than us. Protected behind levee systems, which are often designed up to what is called a 1% AEP event, multiple flood experiences that don't actually happen to test the system limits will tend to reinforce for everyone in the community a false sense of security. And in research, it's come to be called the levee effect. Also quite tellingly, research shows that many people who die in floodwaters live within 45 kilometres of home. So what it says to us is, for us as members, living people, residents of a, of a floodplain, we again, we underestimate the behaviour and the impact of floods and of flood events in our familiar environment and we overestimate our abilities. And it's volunteers in our SES who work within our local communities to educate and to protect us. I guess my point across these two diverse environments is the social cognitive processes that we all use to think about risk will both help us and hinder us in preparing for and coping with these unfamiliar events. And the risk is massive damages and fatalities. So, therefore, what I'm studying is, I want to study, I'm studying what motivates those of us who did live on the floodplain to take the time out of our complex and extremely busy lives to prepare for what are infrequent, low probability, but high impact extreme flood events. Until we better understand what of the many factors that are out there motivate us to take protective measures, when in reality floods are a distant memory or something we don't even know about, we actually are quite limited as to how we can improve our risk education approaches. As a research and emergency management community, our goal has to be to improve community flood resilience. To reach our goal, we actually need to better understand what the most effective preparations are in different risk locations and then what motivates different at-risk communities to do those things. And then, how best to communicate these types of protective measures. And last but not least, we actually need to measure how well we do all this. So I'm, I am really feel privileged to be a person that's doing a PhD looking at that area. And my PhD is actually sponsored by the Hunter Valley Flood Mitigation Scheme Manager, set within the New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. I think it's indicative of their willingness to embrace new ideas, to deliver resilient outcomes beyond building and maintaining levees and physical infrastructure. Levee systems, like every other man-made structure, it has, they have design limitations, as well as social, economic and environmental trade-offs. Around the globe, emergency managers know we've pretty much reached the limits of physical infrastructure to give us flood protection. Extreme events will exceed those limits and resilient communities of the future will need to do things differently to prepare for those extreme flood events. In my view, it is in the time before future events. What we do, how we do it, and our willingness to learn, that's going to matter most for our resilience. If there's anyone in the audience who happens to live on the Hunter Valley floodplains, please come and talk to me after the lecture because I've got much I want to learn and I'd love to hear your stories. So that's what I'm going to do and why with my PhD. And now, the third most important thing is my honour to introduce Commissioner Fitzsimmons tonight. As uncontrolled fires ravaged much of New South Wales from late 2019, 
reaching a crisis point in January 2020, one man's leadership and compassion stood out and helped us to cope with and make sense of the incredible devastation. Shane Fitzsimmons, then the New South Wales Rural Fire Service Commissioner, did that. After leading New South Wales communities through some of their darkest times in that recent history, Shane Fitzsimmons announced he would head up a new government agency, Resilience New South Wales. He was welcomed into his new role with the immediate challenge of supporting New South Wales communities through the COVID-19 pandemic. And most recently, with less than a year under his belt in this position, he's actually had to assist, assisting with the response to flooding, which has hit vast areas of our state. Commissioner Fitzsimmons was appointed Resilience New South Wales Inaugural Commissioner and Deputy Secretary Emergency Management in May of 2020. He chairs the State Emergency Management Committee, the State Recovery Committee and National Emergency Medal Committee. The appointment to Resilience New South Wales follows a distinguished career with the New South Wales Rural Fire Service, as well as council and director roles across state and national emergency management authorities. Commissioner Fitzsimmons' career has been acknowledged with the New South Wales Rural Fire Long Service Medal, recognising 30 years of service, the National Medal, recognising more than 35 years of service, and the Australian Fire Service Medal. He's also a Paul Harris Fellow and holds a Paul Harris Fellow Sapphire from the Rotary Clubs of Barara and Sydney. Please join me in welcoming Resilience New South Wales Commissioner Shane Fitzsimmons to the stage. Thank you, Willow, and good evening, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to join you uh, on what I'm sure will be uh, a very insightful and beneficial panel discussion later this evening. Just nearly 12 months into this new role, Resilience New South Wales, and if I backdate a little, uh, I need to confess that during the middle of the bushfire season, uh, I'd been in discussions with the Premier and the Minister and the head of the public service uh, for the last year or so prior to that. I'd been commissioner of the organisation for over a decade, uh, and I've always been of the view <clears throat> that there's benefit in all of us uh, determining for ourselves uh, when it's time to do something different. And I always wanted to be one of those people that didn't outstay their welcome or their relevance in a role, and I'd actually agreed uh, to leave the Rural Fire Service uh, in August of 2019. The challenge was <clears throat> that 2019 and 20 uh, started shaping up as a really difficult fire season. There's a couple of phrases you won't find me using. The first is black summer, uh, and the second is social distancing. I won't use the phrase black summer because it does a remarkable disservice to the so many of communities across New South Wales that are experiencing fires, destructive and deadly fires, well before summer. As a matter of fact, we were, we were averaging over 1,000 fires a month during winter, June, July and August, more than 1,000 fires a month in New South Wales. So as I came back from annual leave <coughs> in July, uh, I signalled with the government that I thought it would be appropriate to stay for the season because it was shaping up to be another busy one. The forecast was very similar to the year before. We had no idea it would be as bad as what it ultimately turned out to be. But as we went through that unprecedented fire season, they approached me uh, particularly given the scale of damage and destruction and dislocation in local communities and the extraordinary recovery effort that would be required, that they were keen to set up a new organisation that would lead the recovery uh, of a scale and magnitude we'd never experienced before, but more importantly, uh, to have a broader focus on disaster management and pre preparation and coordination for the state of New South Wales. And as a pretty simple firefighter growing up through the organisation, having this new organisation be uh, recovery, disaster preparedness and emergency management resonated with me. Uh, so I said, yes, that would be a sort of role that would appeal to me very much, particularly uh, with my connection with the fire service and looking after communities impacted by those fires. When we got close to announcing the new organisation, this word resilience came up. And I have to confess, I had a fairly candid conversation with the Premier and the Minister and the, and the government. And I said, where's the bloody hell's this word resilience come from? I thought we were talking about disaster preparedness, emergency management and recovery. I got that. 
And I said, no, 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 Shane, this is going to be a little bit broader than that. We want resilience to be the broader discussion and not just central to the traditional convention of emergency management and disaster uh, preparedness and then the recovery. I did say that no one would understand it and I had to, in very quick terms, eat a lot of humble pie because what I learned very quickly was that everybody's got a view on resilience. And I don't know about you, but I think 2020, uh, just be, not just because I was in the job, I'm sure, I don't think I've, word the word, I don't think I've heard the word resilience used more uh, in public discourse and social discussions and business discussions than I have in 2020. Now, I could be wrong, I could just be sensitive to the word, uh, but I think the compounding effects of what we've experienced as a state uh, and as a nation uh, in the last 18 months to two years really brought home uh, this word resilience. And what do I mean by that? Well, it caused me to do a deal of reading, lots of discussions, but most importantly, a lot of listening to people in community, to people in government, in business, in representative organisations and some of our tertiary institutions. And I got to thinking a lot and seeking to build my own understanding of what resilience means in this new organisation. But if we cast our mind back 18 months to two years, we're talking about a jurisdiction, the state of New South Wales, that was on its knees with drought, the hottest, driest period in centuries, uh, and indeed the hottest, driest period on record, the worst drought in centuries, that resulted in 100%, 100 of the geographic area of New South Wales being drought declared or drought affected. It provided the precursor, the backdrop, the landscape to what ultimately became the worst ever and unprecedented fire season for New South Wales. Fires starting in winter, burning all the way through to the other end of summer. Just under 12,000 fires, fires that went for 160 days uh, of operational intensity, consecutive days and 200 consecutive days of declared bushfire emergencies. A damage and destruction toll like we've never seen before, five and a half million hectares, hundreds of communities damaged, dislocated, destroyed, and lives taken. 26 lives taken, including seven firefighters, four volunteers, uh, and three air crew that were on contract and part of the firefighting family here in the state. It amassed a response effort like we've never seen before, uh, 6,500 people came to our aid from every state and territory around, around Australia, including New Zealand, United States and Canada, and they were all integrated into operations. The Premier agreed to issue citations to those that contributed directly to the firefighting effort. So far we've given out just over 75,000 citations to the people that were actively involved in the firefighting effort. It was an extraordinary community response. But with that, with that extraordinary event that didn't let up uh, until February of 2020 when the rains came, those rains came all right. They came all right across a very denuded landscape from drought and fire. And those communities that had been through drought, that had been through fires, were now experiencing a number of locations, extraordinary storm damage, erosion, flooding, landslides. And then as we came out of that in February, uh, into March and April, we were well and truly into the thick of COVID-19 pandemic and all that came with the response to living and working through the implications of a COVID-19 pandemic response. And then of course, as was mentioned in March of this year, on top of the COVID, on top of the fires, on top of the other storms, on top of the drought, we had some of the worst um, uh, uh, most significant rainfall events, particularly on the mid-north coast, and significant flooding on the mid-north coast and parts of the Hawkesbury Nepean. In the fires, uh, we lost just under 2,500 homes. In the floods, we've got about 1,300 uh, to 1,500 homes that are now uninhabitable. We've just declared 63 local government areas, natural disaster areas, in the floods of March 21. And there's more that will be added to that list as the waters move through parts of New South Wales still. But what's interesting out of those 63 areas declared natural disasters is that 60% of them, 38 of those local government areas, were also natural disaster declared areas for the bushfires on top of the drought. 
So when we talk about resilience, we can't go past the extraordinary and compounding effects to so many communities across New South Wales that were on their knees impacted by drought, belted by bushfires, hit by storms and floods, the extraordinary uh, implications of COVID and, 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 and the deflating and demoralising aspects of COVID in so many of the rural and regional areas where, where business was shut down and, and totally dislocated during the fires over, over the Christmas New Year period. We were then all working together as communities with the want to get out and invest and be present in rural and regional communities to lift their spirits, to spend money, to holiday, to buy things, to access produce. But because of COVID, we shut it all down over Easter. So even when optimism was building and hope was on the horizon, uh, another disaster impeded our ability to connect and resonate. And then, of course, uh, working through the COVID and now more recently with, with storms and floods that have affected, again, so many of those communities. So when I read and when I listen and when I hear what, people, what resilience means to people, more often than not, it's about the common definition of being affected by something uh, and bouncing back, bouncing back to normal. I struggle with that definition because once you've been through something pretty significant and it takes a toll and you rebuild, you repair and you heal, what's normal? Do we seriously go back to where we were beforehand? I don't think so particularly at a personal level, at a human level, at an individual level. Because for me, the whole idea around resilience is how do we, how do we contemplate as individuals, as families, as businesses, as local communities, as governments, how do we contemplate what we are susceptible or vulnerable to? How do we personalise that and comprehend that vulnerability or susceptibility and convert that into thought and action. And if we do accept our vulnerability or our susceptibility to whatever it is, and it's not always the default to natural disasters, natural disasters are obvious, but it's also our vulnerability and susceptibility to our reliance on how we live, work and function as a society. So our dependency on utilities, uh, periods of outage without power, uh, without sewer and water, without communications and connectivity, how do we operate and function? So if we personalise that vulnerability or susceptibility, what can we do to ameliorate or lessen the impact, uh, to seek to prevent or mitigate as much as we can the impact of that, of that next event, that next disaster? And if we are confronted with it, how do we plan and contemplate the best response possible to deal with whatever we're confronted with? And then most importantly, how do we come out the other side better, stronger, and improved as a result of, of that experience. So for me, resilience is about learning from others and learning from experiences, but most importantly, it's about learning through lived experiences. In the last 18 months or so, one of the most confronting conversations I had was late one night on the way home talking to a former colleague reflecting on some anniversary milestones of some tragedy from the, from the fires of 1920, particularly around the loss of life. It was an emotional conversation. There were tears at both ends of the phone. We were having a chat and reflecting on what had happened and where people were up to now. And I said to him, how are you travelling? You're going OK? He said, yes, I am. He said, I'm getting help, I'm getting assistance, and it's making a big difference. And I said, that's fantastic. I said, what's it doing? He said, well, it's helping, it's helping with my relationship with the wife and kids. I didn't realise how much I was shutting them out and how much they wanted to connect with me. He said, it's also helping me a lot back in the workplace and connecting with my volunteers. And I said, that's fantastic. I'm really proud of you. I said, you're going to keep going? He said, absolutely. Uh, it's making a difference and I'm going to keep accessing the services. Thank you very much. I said, all right, mate, no problem. We'll catch up later. And he said, Shane, you've got to promise me something. And I said, what's that? He said, you can't tell anyone. I said, I beg your pardon? He said, you can't tell anyone. I said, can't tell anyone what? And he said, you can't tell anyone that I'm getting assistance. And of all the things that we'd been working through, that was the thing that floored me. 
And I did say to him, I said, you've got to be flippin' kidding. And I did, did not use the word flippin', but in this audience I probably should. But why do I say that? Because if we reflect and comprehend that resilience is through learned and lived experiences, then why do we still have this extraordinary stigma and this convenience of overlooking that with lived experiences and learning lessons, we gloss over the fact that more often than not, those disruptions, those emergencies, those disasters, those losses, invariably have a deep and troublesome emotional and psychological toll on us all. Whether that's losing a loved one, losing the family pet, whether it's, whether it's being involved in the middle of a disaster like we've been talking about in the last little while. Why is it that we gloss over and don't want to talk about the fact that we're emotionally and psychologically affected by these traumatic and difficult events? Why do we, particularly as men, and I'm going to single out men based on my experience uh, in the fire and emergency services, but also in rural and regional New South Wales, why is it that men are expected to carry this extraordinary masculinity of BS of yesteryear that says men cope through these things and their feelings and their emotions are not impacted because they're strong. Resilience is about strength, but resilience is about, is about building on lessons and learning and readying ourselves and positioning ourselves and our community for the next event and the next disruption so we can better cope, so we can ameliorate, we can deal with and we can come back stronger out the other side. It's an extraordinarily frustrating set of circumstances, I find. What I also found in my readings was a great bit of literature coming out of the United States. <clears throat> I think it's the, the Psychologist um, Association of the United States. And they describe resilience like a kayaker going down a river. And going down that river from time to time, we're going to find placid, calm waters. Then we're going to find some pretty turbulent waters, some rapids, some boulders, some surge in the water. In other areas, we might even get tossed out of the canoe or the kayak. We might even find our kayak gets busted up and we've got to get a new kayak. But when we get back in and we continue down the river, we'll find that there's calmer waters ahead. But based on the experience of going through those previous rapids, we've learned a great deal. So we're readying ourselves for the next one. And in theory, we continue to go down uh, on this journey. So when I reflect enormously uh, on, on what I've learnt uh, over the last 12 months in setting up this new organisation, resilience is not the sole purview of any individual. It's not the sole purview of a family. No one government can resolve it. No one local government can resolve it. No business can resolve it. It requires a community effort to pull together and build resilience. Individually and collectively, if we give each other permission to talk to each other about how we're thinking, how we're feeling, what we're contemplating, pre an event, pre a disaster, but importantly, during and post the disaster, I have no doubt, A, the stronger uh, and speedier uh, we will build and come out the other side better and stronger, but also a problem shared or a problem uh, contemplated and shared uh, is more readily a problem solved uh, and solutions realised. We are seeing across New South Wales with record um, uh, packages and support programs for, for recovery and rebuilding, we are seeing locally led decisions and priorities, finding nuance and what matters in one community as the absolute priority is different to another community. So when we talk about resilience, we've got to understand that just like communities are different, you and I are all different, so we've got to make sure that our policies and our architecture uh, of frameworks around support and assistance and investments are nuanced to the point that they're applicable and relevant and prioritised at that local level. And when I think about resilience and particularly recovery, we all default to infrastructure. We all default to the building back better of things the repair, the reconstruction, the rebuilding, the modification, and they're all important. But the thing we've got to do more individually and collectively is realise that the critical part of that recovery journey, that recovery effort, 
is the healing, the emotional and psychological repair, sharing and coming together as families, as businesses, as local communities goes a long way to helping with the repair and the recovery and the healing in those local communities because when they open up and talk to each other, they also seem to land much more readily on what the shared priorities are for those local communities. Absolutely, we are learning more today about not just repairing and rebuilding to the same as what was there before. It's actually about repairing and rebuilding with betterment and improvement, building on the lessons of the past, the analysis of the past, and indeed, the experiences of that current event. I sincerely look forward uh, to joining my colleagues on the panel tonight uh, and having an open and frank discussion around what you and I think resilience might be and what it might look like going forward. I'm very pleased to be part of a new organisation <clears throat> that's going to take a broad look for government across all of government, industry, business, working together, local councils, local government, local communities, and indeed our jurisdictional and Commonwealth partners to understand and map our vulnerabilities and susceptibilities, what our investment options might be to build and improve on that, and then importantly, how do we respond and deal with and then recover and rebuild, repair and heal after those extraordinary events. Thank you for the opportunity to join you tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Shane. So it's incredibly interesting hearing someone talk about their personal stories and, and men talking about emotions and thinking about moving forward and transformation and learning, all things at the university and also our community, as well as the next speaker and the person who's going to moderate this panel, our Lord Mayor, Neurotelia Nelms, has taught me a great deal about. She was one of the first people to welcome me to our fantastic city. And I'm going to give a very personal opening about her because it was one of those days where you're really, really nervous because you've got this incredible woman coming to launch this thing which may or may not work. And we were all wearing really, um, I'll say, bright, we'll call it fluoro pink for this event and she came in and said can I have a t-shirt too which you don't often get a deputy you don't get a Lord Mayor who wants a t-shirt too so it's fantastic that she's joining us here tonight she certainly knows a lot about leading through resilience she certainly knows about some of the challenges we face in our community and she's incredibly open to a range of ideas that come from all parts of our communities and i've seen her engage with incredibly marginalized and disadvantaged communities as well as people who are incredibly eloquent so with that i'd like to welcome our lord mayor Thank you, Sue Ann, for that lovely introduction. And uh, it wasn't that long ago that the photos of us many years ago wearing the fluoro pink t-shirts came up as a memory on one of my social media feeds and I thought about that very interesting evening when we first met. I thought we were very lucky to have someone of Sue Ann's calibre coming uh, as a professor to the University of Newcastle uh, to work with her landscaping background uh, and teach the, the students coming through the city, the visitors, the international students uh, in that profession. And at the same time, also spend a lot of her time working with us at the city of Newcastle in terms of uh, advising us in, uh, in new ways of thinking about landscaping, um, technical uh, components to delivering city infrastructure, but also very much about thought leadership as a leading academic in the field, she's always very available and open to helping us look at challenges very differently. And I think that's one of the wonderful aspects of having uh, the University of Newcastle working so closely with the city of Newcastle. When Sue Ann arrived, it wasn't long after we had uh, secured the CIFAL, the uh, United Nations uh, Training Centre here in the city of Newcastle. And that was quite a large coup for the Asia Pacific region, for the University of Newcastle 
and the City of Newcastle to be co-hosting the CIFAL. And the importance of actually having the CIFAL located, and obviously many of you in the audience would um, maybe have experienced the work or the benefit of having the CIFAL located here in the City of Newcastle. And that only comes through partnership and collaboration. I also would like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the, the panellists that um, I'm going to be moderating tonight, and that is uh, wonderful to have Willow, uh, who has a very uh, uh, exceptionally uh, high career in, uh, in the corporate world and has taken her community role um, to the next level where she's actually doing a PhD and working on uh, areas that intersect uh, in our daily life at the City of Newcastle, partic particularly around uh, beach safety, um, the resilience of our coastline, I won't go into all of that right now, and also flooding. And when I say that, and I, and I know the Commissioner needs no introduction, and thank you, Commissioner, for that wonderful, very open and honest introduction about your entry into your new role. Uh, as the New South Wales Person of the Year. I feel like a lot of us already know you, but it's wonderful to have that uh, personal introduction to the City of Newcastle. And as I introduce those panellists and also thank them for inviting me um, here this evening to, to be able to ask the questions, which is very different to some of my normal roles, I also reflect on what the city has been through just in the last few years since I've been Lord Mayor, but also in my lifetime, and I'm 45. Uh, I was 13 when the earthquake hit Newcastle and I saw the impacts of that. I was uh, in my late teens, early 20s, uh, experiencing the closure of BHP firsthand in the city of Newcastle. Uh, I'm now the Lord Mayor of the City of Newcastle that has seen um, East Coast lows. I uh, was an elected councillor in 2008, a year after the Pasha Bolka, so saw the impact and the clean-up of the Pasha Bolka, and now through the pandemic. And we have worked very closely um, with a task force uh, formed last year during the pandemic to actually look at some of those more fine-grained granular impacts of the pandemic through the city of Newcastle. So it is very multifaceted and it's uh, not just about the disaster and managing the disaster or managing the risk of a disaster and then rebuilding that infrastructure, which obviously you know, is a very significant role in local government. But the commissioner is right, it's about people. And our roles and my roles always are about people, putting people at the centre of that decision-making process. And I think that that is really the right mindset and the right framework to be um, working through in terms of uh, what the new agency in New South Wales is going to do. And I'm actually really glad they chose the name Resilience. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, um, I will finish, but again, thank you and also welcome the panellists to the stage. I'll just make my turned on. It could be automated. Oh, there I am. Thank you very much. Uh, before we get started, uh, I just wanted to familiarise yourselves, and I believe there's also people potentially online with the Q&A process uh, for this evening's panel. Uh, if you are watching online, there is a QR code in the corner of your screen, which you can scan and then submit questions to. For those here in this room, so that's all of you here, uh, you can scan the QR code on the big screen or see the staff in the wings if you're having any trouble. And we'll be able to answer those questions that you're uploading. I have been given an iPad, so I will get those questions sent through to me. So any burning questions you have of our wonderful panellists here this evening. And I can also take questions from the floor if time permits. So just to kick off this evening, I thought, um, while the questions are still coming through, I would ask the Commissioner, our, our guest here this evening, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges facing uh, 
the building of resilience for our communities here in the Hunter and the greater Newcastle area? Look, I think, I think like so many areas, uh, it is, if I default back to the 1920 fire season, it was an unprecedented fire season. 5.5 uh, million hectares of countryside burnt over the most protracted period of time ever recorded in the state of New South Wales. 5.5 million hectares is enormous. And the dryness in the landscape meant that we were seeing some of the worst fire behaviour and fire spread at 2, 3 and 4 a.m., which is contrary to convention where you would normally see that at 2, 3 and 4 p.m. Uh, in the afternoon when conditions are typically hotter and, dry, uh, hotter and windier and drier. It was unprecedented during 1920. It is no longer unprecedented. And whilst 5.5 million hectares burnt, the state of New South Wales is 80 million hectares. So only 6 or 7% of the state was burnt. But if we look at the forested country, the Great Dividing Range, closer to 20 to 25% of the forest burnt. There's still 75% of those forests left and more than 90% of the state that's susceptible to fire. There are large tracts of the Greater Hunter, Greater Newcastle region, Central Coast, Greater Sydney, that didn't get significantly impacted by fire last season. So ironically, as experience will also back me in here, after any large fire, the communities that are most prepared for the next five years, in so many ways, are the least that need to be because they're completely burnt out, it's fresh in their mind, they're, they're doing things around their property, they're rebuilding their home with an absolute focus on, on prevention and mitigation uh, to better withstand the next fire. Uh, the absurdity is that they're the ones that least need to do all that effort there and then. It's everybody else who wasn't impacted by fires during 1920 that should be heeding those extraordinary lessons and actually doing their part in and around their property for the next big event. What I would also say is because, it's unpre because it was unprecedented and it no longer is, whilst I'm not suggesting the 1920 fire season is something that will be, re be replicated every season, what it does signal to us, in concert with the forecast and the prediction for some time now, uh, of more frequent, more intense, more difficult fire weather, uh, sorry, uh, extreme weather events and fire seasons and those sorts of things, um, we need to recast our thinking that the 1920 fire season is now the new extreme. And we need to start getting our head around that and what that means in preparing communities, um, our infrastructure, our people, uh, and all in between. So fire is just one example. Uh, and as Willow, I'm sure we'll talk about more pertinently from here. If I look at the events of March with the flooding event and the rain event, um, we've still got the season between now and the middle of the year where East Coast lows and big weather events are still very likely. I remember very vividly the June long weekend with the Pasha Bolka and things like that. And so we can't rule out another big weather event coming in the, in the next, in the next uh, couple of months. So how do we build that preparedness and that readiness? Um, and similarly, I think uh, what has happened out of 2020 uh, is that COVID, if I can say there's a silver lining in it, what I mean is invariably in history sense, a disaster happened somewhere. People generally got this extraordinary and remarkable outpouring of love and care and compassion and generosity for those that are being impacted, but it happened somewhere. Uh, and it's usually geographic, geographically quite limited. And then once the immediate support's done, people move on and get on with their busy lives. Um, and you get this natural complacency or apathy that it's not happening to me, but it's happening to somebody else. I think COVID has been the leveller. And I think it's reminded us all that we are vulnerable and susceptible to things. So what is the next thing that we are vulnerable and susceptible to? And how do we get, how do we get social discourse? How do we get the dialogue going? to start getting people to think about what they're vulnerable and susceptible to, particularly in an environment going forward where we can expect um, more extreme and frequent uh, weather events, when we've got a growing dependency on the interconnectedness and the high availability and performance of, of infrastructure, of utilities, of telecommunications, 
the more we do, the more we rely on those things. And if, if you pick up not just a teenager, you pick up an adult today who can't use their phone, they're buggered. You know, because we, we, our life revolves around these devices for everything around business, banking, shopping, you know, communicating. If we can't charge and run these devices, we'll have anarchy. So what, what happens if the communications networks go out, if the ability to charge these things go out? So there's so much more than just the natural disaster environment that we've got to think about uh, going forward. That's a wonderful insight and probably a good uh, lesson for our local communities that weren't as impacted as some of our neighbours uh, during the bushfire season in particular and also uh, to some degree for the flooding. In, in Newcastle, just uh, in this area alone, it was touch and go if we had have had, um, it, it was spread out over a longer period. So it allowed the infrastructure to cope. Um, we were watching it and watching it and going, we can cope with that volume of rainfall, but we just can't cope with it in a shorter amount of time. But it was on the edge. So it's very likely, as living on a floodplain, that it would happen. And I think that would lead me to asking Willow uh, around your thoughts on how individuals can actually contribute because there's so much in our lives. How do we as individuals contribute to building resilience? That is a really big question. I have another two years to go on my PhD, you know, in Utali. Um, I think that's one of the things I just want to reflect on um, that is a difficulty with what we do in talking about resilience. We're asking people to contemplate disaster. We're asking people to contemplate stuff that can be emotionally very uncomfortable. And for some people, that's emotionally unprotective. Um, I think we have to be nuanced in what we ask of people in doing this. And I guess I come from the perspective of thinking that most people are doing their best. Um, and we need to be very careful in how we do our risk communication to acknowledge that for some people, one of the ways they prepare is to make sure they're emotionally protected. Um, so I think I just wanted to put that first because I think that's a really important thing that we need to take into account when we're talking about people's mental health. Um, but uh, above and beyond that, um, a bunch of the research, after a year of reading an awful lot of really good stuff by some really talented people from around the world, um, there's an acknowledgement that we're not motivated necessarily to prepare by talking about the risk itself. And so in the past, a bunch of what we've done has maybe focused too much on that. But equally, we haven't necessarily done the level of research to test exactly what works yet. So we can't just, we shouldn't just follow in our intuition. There is some research that says sometimes we get it wrong. We actually do need to do the, the work on it. I think the, the areas that people are looking at now is to say some of the more effective ways to communicate is to think about what, what you're asking someone to do. Let's say whether you're saying to them you want them to um, do the fire break or whatever around the house and in the flood sense it might be to prepare yourself for some sort of a slight inundation is to talk about how you can do that task. So explain so that people can, can lift their own sense of, of ability to do it and also to explain the costs and benefits of doing that, both in, in dollars and, and cents terms as well as emotionally, what are the positive experiences of doing it and what are the negative experiences of doing it. Um, I was actually mentioning to someone else earlier that I hoped knew more about it than me, was that one of the things I stumbled across in the American stuff is that on a flood, to stop all the horrible sewer and other stuff coming into your house, you can go and get a cheap one-way valve from Bunnings, you know, it's $11. But I couldn't find anywhere telling me how to do it. So those sorts of things are maybe, once you figure out those are the important things to do, it may not just be about risk, it might be about how do we work together? And the other, the other component that they talk about in the research is what are our social norms? And that's looking around and seeing who else, who do I, what does the pe important people in my life think about me doing these things? Would they encourage it? And then I'm more likely to do it. Um, who are the role models that I look around and see? And are they doing it? And that will encourage us to do it. And, and another theme is around 
the sort of the moral responsibility that we feel. And there's some really interesting research around that about when we take it on and when we don't. So I actually think we have a lot to learn and as long as we as researchers and emergency management community are open to it, I think we'll influence and support, you know, the rest of us who are householders better in the future. I think that's excellent advice, even with two years to go. <laughs> it There are roles for all of us as individuals, but there are also roles for us um, as community leaders, uh, as experts in our fields. And I've had a question uh, come through from uh, Slido, thank you, and the audience, uh, around the role that architecture plays in building resilience. And even just to broaden that out, around uh, government and community leaders, uh, th their roles in building community re resilience. I might attack that from a few different ways or approach it from different, a few different ways. So I guess I'm the head of a school built environment and architecture and so we deal a lot with the physical world and things that are very tangible, very technical and, and, and very governed. And often that's about safety and risk adversity and, and really um, thinking about community health and well-being. And, and occupational health and well-being. And I take that very seriously, and so do our students and staff, but, and so do practitioners, but I also think um, some of the things that are underlying the conversation we're having tonight are around what I would call everyday aspects of resilience. And um, what does it mean to live in a floodplain and, and accept that it's going to flood? And how do you, as an architect, as a person who lives there who might work with an architect or a landscape architect or a construction manager, um, how do you learn to live with being in a floodplain? How do you live, learn to live with um, being in an area that might have a devastating or a difficult fire condition? We have seven different fire ecologies, it's going to happen. And so one of the things that I like students in the built environment and my staff to do, and they, and they do it incredibly well, is one, look at indigenous people. Okay, we're talking about serious resilience. Uh, over 60,000 years of all sorts of social, um, environmental, all the challenges you can throw at that knowledge and the way that they've maintained and that knowledge continues and transforms and grows and offers up different perspectives to perhaps what, where I was, you know, I was educated in the US, which is a very Western way of learning. So one is thinking about it through another set of lenses. Um, I think it's, it's also that for, for years and years and years, and I happen to work quite closely with engineers and we'll have a very exciting closing statement by an engineer, that there was this thing about fixing the problem, finding the one answer. And there's nothing wrong with engineers and, and that aspect of some of what they do, but we need lots of answers and lots of options, and there's never one single answer. There's lots of different ways of approaching it. So one of the things that I think architecture, construction management, landscape architecture bring to this is they offer up a range of ways of living with and living in and, and thinking about a range of ways to approach different problems, which comes back to something Shane talked about in terms of it's really specific to the locale. It's really specific to context. Now, they, may have, they might have similar challenges, but that community might have different values, might have different aspects that they need to deal with. So I think that what built environment professions bring to this collectively is that ability to sort of give you multiple answers, multiple ways forward, but also to think about a very particular context at a particular time. I think that gives us some, some good insight. Just in terms of a, a follow-up question, in terms of built environments, we obviously live in a metropolitan area in a built environment here that is in a floodplain. We're all bracing for our next round of East Coast lows uh, here in Newcastle. There, there must be some ways that we can maybe do urban planning better, uh, mixed with better architecture. I know we had a lot of lessons learned from the earthquake here in terms of um, construction methodology. Is there, is there a way, is there, is, not, is there one single way or is there many different ways that can actually be implemented? I think it's interesting because I, 
I often get on those design review panels, right? And, and there's policy and levers that are trying to govern things like a, a, del a development approval, where you're trying to get the very best. Um, but there's lots of different ways of going around that. And that's a whole other panel, I suspect. But it, it's, there's, there's never a single answer, but I think about things every day here in Newcastle like urban heat island effect, which we've worked on with the Smart Cities team, and, and it's not just about the fact that we need more shade and because it's getting hotter and we have less water, but we also need to think about our public realm in a way where we have human thermal comfort, which means it's comfortable to be outside when it's hot out. And you can say, well, just plant better trees or trees that are more resilient to climate change and things like that. But it's not just about trees. It's about the materials we select on the ground, the materials we select for benches. And so there's a whole litany of ways of approaching it. And I think for me, it's having a sort of a, a series of complex ways of unpacking it, but also a series of options that that people can choose from based on budget, based on how quick they want it to happen, how long they have. And, and coming back to um, the, the kind of, I think there are some basic principles that we tend to get through policy and legislation, which I think we learn from experience and policymakers and planners in particular understand that realm, but how they're translated and how they help us do better design how they help us engage better with our communities and help help communities understand why it's important when just even communicating um, things like urban heat island effect to normal people who don't read heat maps is a really interesting, challenging endeavor. Um, but, but also just understanding that if it's a 50 degree day, maybe taking the baby out and waiting for a bus at Walls End is a difficult prospect. So that, and I'm using Walls End because I know that, that, that there's some shade issues there, but if you have to take public transport, what do you do? And so that's a city partnership with a community partnership to think about, and I know you guys are working on it, doing a really great job, but it is that thing where just even recognizing to that, that person that that might be dangerous. That's not something that you're taught in school or that you know, you're gonna learn on television or even social media. And so part of, I think, the role that we all play as individuals and as, as people who are engaged in this and certainly as a, a city or a, a, a state is really thinking about how do we work with the nuances and how do we get people to understand that this is a really complex set of things, but how do we just make your lives better and make you safer? Thank you. I could see uh, the Commissioner um, probably had something to add on that, so I'll, I'll hand it over to you. So, so a couple of things, just picking up on that conversation with, with Willow and Sue Ann. I think it's Einstein that said the definition of stupidity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. It's words of those effect. And what's interesting is, if we look at where we have settled as white folk, particularly in the last couple of hundred years, what we know now, if we had the opportunity to rethink where we built and how we laid out, we simply wouldn't do it. Even, even trying to apply the policy constructs of today to settlement of yesteryear just simply don't apply. So we've got to understand that A, we've got this extraordinary legacy design and development, which is, which is really problematic. So, so we still need to address that. And then ultimately, going forward, we've got to build those lessons in and seek to prevent or, or learn the lessons of the past, not to, to repeat the same thing again. I particularly pick up on Willow's point as well, and I agree with what she said. And, and leveraging my own experience in the fire space, after big fires impact areas and there's considerable property loss, historically we would get researchers out through the natural, uh, the bushfire and natural hazard CRC and they would go in and they would meet with impacted communities and seek to understand what they did, why they did it, so on and so forth. Um, and what we found was, was some pretty compelling uh, data sets. Generally speaking, it was over 70% of people recognised they lived in some of the highest risk areas in the state, if not the world, but that same 70 odd percent of people also conceded they knew they should have, could have, and if only they would have done more to prepare themselves and their property 
then the result might be a little bit different. So what we found through that research was, and when we, when we started pulling the social science uh, scientists together, is people, people, if they do get a general sense of being in an at-risk area, they don't personalise it, they don't individualise it, um, and therefore trying to convert that into action is really problematic because we've got some great Aussieisms, some great cultural traits, you know, and this relaxed, casual nature, she'll be right, mate, is good most of the time, but it ain't that good when it comes to preparing for and dealing with uh, risk and disasters and, and what have you. And the other com compelling statistic that I came to, to learn at the end of last year in my new role and the prospect of La Nina uh, dominating this season and impacting areas like the Hawkesbury Nepean catchment. The February massive rainfall event of 2020 took our Warragamba Dam from 40-something percent to 80-something percent from memory. A massive amount of water fell through the catchment, but the dam had a capacity to absorb so much of the water. We had that recent... Um, uh, oh, sorry, and then so what we did was we said, well, if the dam's full um, and we get another big rainfall event through La Nina, we're not going to have the same absorption capacity. There's going to be pretty significant flooding. We identified some research through the high-risk flood areas of the Hawkesbury Nepean. 82% of people that lived and worked in that area that were surveyed had no knowledge that they were in high flood risk area. That's frightening. So accordingly, of the 82%, 80% had done nothing about it. Had, had, hadn't given thought to what would happen, what would they do and how would they do it in the event that a flood, that a flood occurred. When we started doing some targeted awareness programs, we raised that profile and I think 70% of people conceded that they'd done something or given some thought to it. The other thing we learnt through the fires and picking up on Willow's point is that when we ask people why they didn't have a plan or why they didn't do preparatory work or, or think through you know, some things around their home, around their property or have a plan of what they'll do, the default position was that they thought it was too onerous, too hard and too costly. So with the old Einstein definition of stupidity, we thought to rewrite things like survival plans. We thought to rewrite you know, what it, what it means to actually be prepared because we knew in fires that more than 90% of all properties that are destroyed by fire don't burn through the fire front, they burn through ember attack. So the more we can shift people's thinking to preparing the home is actually about the increased survivability of the property in the home, it helps firefighters get there and do things, blah, blah, blah. So, so distilling it down into bite-sized chunks that are low cost or no cost, that are really simple and easy to do, can actually make all the difference. And when it comes to raising awareness, I don't know how many of you travel to places like Lismore, um, uh, but when I was out in the Hawkesbury Nepean recently, in the, in, the, in the homes with some people that were inundated with the flood, you sit at their veranda and the river level on a normal day is probably 10 or 15 metres below where you're standing. But in that same house during this flood, which wasn't a big one, it was a 1 in 20, 1 in 10, 10 year flood, uh, it was above their roof line. So how do people comprehend that that river can be higher than the roof in the house that they're standing on the back veranda of? And when you go to places like um, Lismore, uh, you check into motels, you go into businesses, you go into pubs and things, and they've got these pretty confronting um, depictions on their walls. You go into the reception of a motel and you'll see these lines that'll say, you know, X year flood got to here and X year flood got to here and you're thinking, crikey, I'm, if I stood here now, my head would be underwater. So, so the things that we can do to let people know that this stuff is real, uh, if we had the answer to that, it would help enormously without frightening them unnecessarily but, it's, but we have to get in and get people to understand what the risk really is, even though it might be infrequent and low probability, as you say, but the consequence can be rather significant or very high, you know? Like, so, so there are some real challenges in that space, in my view, and I, I think I'm echoing your, your comments, Willow, there. Um, it, it's massive. To follow up on that um, and uh, slightly uh, broader topic, we've had one from the audience and that, that has basically said uh, resilience should be a national priority 
And has there been any signal from the Australian government that you know of around establishing a similar agency to the one established with you here in New South Wales? There sure is. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I met with the new head of the um, national body and his name happens to be Shane as well. So, so heaven help all of us when someone, Shane from Resilience, said this was okay. If it's good, it was me. If it wasn't, it's Shane Stone from the feds. But no, no, I, I caught up with... Uh, Shane uh, recently and we've been able to have some conversation with the Minister and the PM uh, over the last 12 months particularly but they they have formally established a new national agency called Recovery and Resilience, Resilience and Recovery it, it, it was going to be called Resilience Australia but they thought that was too cute to be close to Resilience New South Wales so we're going to Recovery and Resilience but, but fundamentally the correlation is extremely strong um, and and the, the, the original plan was to set up that agency on the 1st of July, but given the extraordinary flood events of March, they've brought it into effect uh, earlier, uh, and they'll be working through uh, the standing up and the formation and the structure of the organisation over the coming months. The benefit around that is, is that how do we map a national, a national architecture framework around resilience strategy, resilience investment, resilience uh, narrative and comprehension, and then actually make sure that from the jurisdictional and local areas that we're feeding up into that, and then that can help us understand um, um, vulnerabilities and susceptibilities, what the investments are in terms of no cost, low cost, significant investments uh, in a material sense or in a policy or strategy sense, uh, and having that, having that leverage off the national you know, uh, disaster risk reduction framework and those sorts of things will actually tie in very nicely. So yes, uh, albeit it's in its infancy, uh, we are already starting to work very closely together. And there are similar Res New South Wales bodies in some of the other jurisdictions, um, uh, even though there's still a bit of a division between EM coordination and recovery. Um, uh, we're all talking with each other about what Resilience New South Wales and what uh, recovery and Resilience Australia looks like and how that might be emulated in its own way in other jurisdictions. So we'll end up with a, uh, with a national framework of sorts to do that, if that answers the question. I think that answers the question. I won't go on to a, a side topic of mine around the structure of government <laughs> and the three levels of government, but we'll leave that maybe for another day. I think the other important mm. though, um, Lord Mayor, is... Um, particularly in our remit as an organisation and particularly coming out of some of the most recent inquiries, the Independent Bushfire Inquiry and the Royal Commission into the fires, um, one, of the, one of the big arms of my new structure, one of the big directorates, is around local engagement and coordination. And we find, uh, as would be, you know, not unexpected, but the disparity of capability and capacity across local governments uh, around New South Wales and further, well, I can only speak for New South Wales, is quite different and that was really certainly shown up during, during the recent disasters of the fires and what have you. Uh, in some areas, for example, councils will have their local emergency management officer uh, as part of the executive. In other areas, they're the part-time weeds inspector or dog catcher. So how do we, how do we make sure we're investing in and partnering uh, more closely with local councils, local communities, to build that local capability and capacity because, in my view, the best led anything is that which is locally led but facilitated, enabled, sponsored and supported uh, by other layers of government. Uh, and local government are core to and key to uh, that planning, uh, that design and ultimately the execution, uh, whether it is the response effort or the recovery effort. Yes, you're supported by... Uh, by the EM fraternity, but ultimately embedded in the local EOCs and then ultimately leading the recovery effort, local government is the key. And unfortunately, we've never even required um, a consistent standard simple template on what that looks like across the state. Uh, and councils that seem to perform better, uh, and certainly through the, through the 1925 season, were those councils that unfortunately had a recency of a similar major disaster in their area. So there was a, there was a mental um, um, uh, capability based on recent experience about what worked and what didn't work and how we would seek to emulate that again. So 
there is a significant chapter, not just in the Commonwealth, uh, but certainly uh, through local government, local business, local not-for-profits and other bodies um, uh, that we're focusing on as a new organisation as well. It sounds uh, like it has a, a, a new focus and a new remit. I have two questions that are very similarly related, both for uh, based on that discussion, but for Sue Ann and for Willow. And that is around how resilience is being taught and delivered at university. But the other one, I'll ask at the same time because it's very related, was uh, do you believe that education in disaster risk reduction will become a bigger priority in the national discord or will the priority remain recovery and reconstruction? Um, as in my master's, which was called, this mouthful was called the Masters of Disaster Resilience and Sustainable Development. Um, I have to say, as a student of that, and some of my lecturers and professors who I dearly love are here, um, but aside from that, I'll tell the truth anyway. I learned so much. Like, here I am, you know, many, many decades as corporate strategist and thought I kind of knew it all. I had no idea. So how important is education? Well, it's absolutely critical. The right type of education and the way it was made incredibly practical. I can't talk about every other um, thing in the country, but I can talk about the one that I did. Um, we have people online doing it from all over Australia and people from, I think we had a couple of people from overseas. It, without that grounding, I wasn't able to recognise the gaps. I wasn't able to understand what the governance structures and risk structures were available to the country, to the globe, to um, state government, local government. Um, I've had the privilege in the last year or so of reading and writing, helping look at all of the information around the Hunter Valley Flood Mitigation Scheme and to understand what has been done over a 200-year history and to be able to put that in context, you can then start to see what we need to do differently and what we can build on. But without the frameworks that I learnt, um, it makes it too hard to know, to identify the gaps and then figure out what are the criteria by which you can assess um, well, actually, before I get to that, is to say what is the nature of the problem. Um, you have to be able to understand the problem from multiple perspectives. You can't just look at it from the perspective of government or the perspective of the SES. In, in the sense of, for instance, when we ask people, households, to prepare, we need to make sure we're asking our households to do tasks that are in their own best interest, not just going to make it easier for emergency services. I'm not saying we shouldn't. Naturally, we've got scarce emergency services. But defining the nature of the problem really matters. And it's only when you get educated in the area that you start to say, what's the nature of the problem? How do we all decide collectively what it should be? Who should be involved? What's the multi-criteria analysis? What are the criteria we're going to use to actually solve it? what's the weighting of that cri each of those criteria, and we need to have a discussion. And the answer's different for different communities, and ultimately, who gets to decide what are the important criteria? And that gets to the heart of what I think you've been talking about, Shane. I think there's a sea change happening under this resilience in New South Wales, at least I'm hopeful, and it's more like risk governance than risk management. And that means we're actually recognising that there's not a one-size-fits-all and we have to have some difficult conversations, but the sooner we have it, the sooner we'll move on. And for anybody in anywhere having to be able to have an education, and there's a bunch of different ways in which you can get it, whether it's a graduate certificate or a master's or something else, I think we really need to rely heavily on our universities. And I would hope that every graduate, undergraduate, gets an opportunity because, unfortunately... I think we're going to be facing way more disasters than we want to in the next couple of decades. Did you want to add to that, yeah, Sue Ann? I, I, I agree. I mean, there's lots of... It's funny, I was thinking about in primary school how you learn, and in kinder, how you learn resilience. And it's usually about some sort of personal experience where you get really challenged. I'm left-handed, and I, when, when they were trying to... They tried to teach me how to write with my right hand. It's, I just can't do it. I can dribble basketball, do lots of great things with my right hand, but my left hand loves to write and draw. And I remember, you know... And I'm one of those people with the paper like that, and that, that kind of very first memory of just just insisting on just doing it the way I did it, which I was very stubborn, you can imagine that. That's what it takes to be a head of school these days. And I, I must admit that 
that kind of resilience to stick with the fact that I could I I could do this, but I might not look like the other kids. And and it's funny because you learn it intuitively, you learn it through through your siblings and all sorts of things, but it starts there. And often when we deal with communities, particularly in, in university life, we deal a lot with, we're very forward facing and we work a lot with communities that are marginalized. And often when we're working with young people and, and kids, the resilience that they show is something we learn from. And I'm always astounded, you know, you'll, you'll have this kid in front of you and we're, we're talking about, you know, so how was it to learn online and how, how'd you go with COVID? Oh, you know, I got really good at this game, but by the way, I can now spell everything backwards and forwards because that's what, that was their way of being incredibly resilient during a really, I'm sure their parents found the challenge more interesting. And so, there is something really important about that aspect, but it's also thinking about, well, how do you deal with resilience at a range of educational levels? And so I think there's things that are already there inbuilt and implicit. Maybe we need to make them more explicit. I think in universities, we're finding more and more that, unfortunately, um, we're not running out of um, material to study for our case studies. We've probably got way more case studies than I'd like us to have. So that means that more and more people are sort of saying, well, I want to make a difference. And I don't, I want to understand it from a range of perspectives. And so I'm going to embed that into my university education. It, it doesn't matter whether it's built environment, business, law, um, humanities. I have to say that resilience and resilience thinking and ways of engaging with extreme issues to do with climate change or, or issues to do with socioeconomic challenges. You know, we're, we're facing one in the hunter with changes in, in essentially what our economic status and, and how we earn a living is going to be. And so all, I think, parts of education can engage with it. And it's just the lens that it, it, is it, it's kind of the lenses at which you interrogate it and learn how to utilize it. I, th I think the nice thing about the very long name of your master's degree is that it combines resilience, it combines um, sustainability. Because that's the other aspect of this that, you know, sort of pre, and it's, it's all lingo from ecology, you know, things that you learn when you, you learn ecology, but the sustainable development aspect of your degree and, and where we're heading with you and SDGs is really important. Incredibly lofty goals, but how do you actually achieve them and how you do that locally, how you do that at a statewide, and that sustainability resilience and that relationship between the two is really important. And it doesn't matter what discipline. I think it's, a, it's across all disciplines. It does, it does lend itself to a very multidisciplinary approach. I mean, I think as you discussed before, I think we only have about five minutes left. So I'm not gonna get to every single question. So I'm trying to bundle them up. Uh, I do have a question here. Uh, around government working with Indigenous communities and it's probably for Shane and it's around assisting them in using traditional practices such as cool burning. Yeah, look, it's, um, I'll be careful what I say here but, the, but the, um, the focus on Indigenous burning, particularly out of the last fire season, <clears throat> we've got to be careful that it just doesn't become a new woke phrase. Um, and having been, having been involved in the... Uh, fire management space now for a few decades. My very first introduction, uh, particularly through national parks, there's always been a strong correlation uh, with our First Nations people and Indigenous burning practices. And often there is a very strong correlation uh, with cool burning for environmental and ecological uh, and cultural uh, benefits. But also they correlate with prescribed burning and prescription burning. But there's also examples where the prescription may be more about asset protection than it is about um, 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 uh, traditional burning. What's also important to understand, and we do do a lot of cultural burning and there's a lot of investment going on uh, across Australia and around New South Wales and has been for quite some time. Um, uh, Indigenous people through land councils and what have you uh, are big landholders uh, in the state of New South Wales. So I think you'll find uh, at the moment uh, there's a focus on building greater capacity uh, to enable 
uh, local Indigenous to partner with other organisations to, to do more uh, burning. Uh, but there's a big difference between burning to reduce fuel loads and cultural burning, because a lot of the cultural burning is actually about connections with country, um, uh, sacred practices, uh, men's and women's spaces, um, um, cultural sensitive uh, sites and locations. And we already factor a lot of that into uh, our planning uh, for prescribed burns and, and deliberate burning, as well as uh, for, for fire suppression and firefighting strategy. Simple answer to your question is, Yes, it's absolutely a part of the framework, has been and will continue to be, and I think there will be um, a growth and a focus in, in profiling that. But we've just got to be careful not to get too carried away with, in my view, a um, uh, suggestion that it's going to make um, uh, or likely to prevent an event like the 2019-20 fire season. So it's not the panacea that sometimes people... Uh, well, people come up with all sorts of different oh, personal theories. Correct. So, 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 so Indigenous burning mm. practices are not the panacea to fire risk, uh, nor is prescribed burning the panacea to fire risk, uh, nor is planning and development, building and construction standards the panacea, um, you know, uh, nor is it you know, uh, adequate fire services spread across a broad geographic area. If fire management was easy, it, it would have been solved you know, centuries ago. Uh, it's very complex, it's very challenging, um, uh, and it drives a lot of emotion. Uh, absolutely. Mm. Uh, with probably only one question left, and just acknowledging uh, the expertise we have in this room and in this city at the City of Newcastle, and as I mentioned, one of the reasons why the UN located their uh, Disaster Risk Reduction and Preparedness Centre here in the City of Newcastle could be a really good way to partner in the future with both Resilience New South Wales and the future recovery and resilience uh, nationally. Uh, having said that, there is a couple of questions, and people, I'm a moderator. They came in and said, question for the Lord Mayor. <laughs> so, you know, you can't be the, the moderator of the panel and then take all the questions. <laughs> That's not fair. But I did get a couple in here also, um, as did the three panellists, around um, the, the interplay with climate change policy and the role of Resilience New South Wales uh, and the role of climate change in coastal management practices. So to finish off, I'll just ask each of the panellists maybe to discuss resilience um, and their view on resilience, as well as addressing climate change. Okay, so, okay. well, um, I wish I was Greta. Um, so what I really love about Greta is this kind of idea of radical hope and, and a kind of, I'll call it climate activism, um, in the sense that if we're talking about a generation that's going to make other generations shift our practices, I, I have to say that they seem to be pushing us harder than perhaps my generation did, and I love that. The, thinking about resilience, I mean, we talked a lot about a, a different scales, different individual, city, state, national, international, and I think it's about this idea of multivalent and, and incredibly contextualized approaches. And, and it is quite an interesting place where bottom-up and community-driven meets sort of top-down and experts. And that's the, the space of it that I think is probably the thing that's going to bear the most fruit, but also uh, offer up a, a range of ways of rethinking how we do things. And for, for me, as an educator and, and, on, and a really good day, a landscape architect, I, I like that. I like the fact that it's that everyone comes to the table with some knowledge and some expertise and that you work out how to, to leverage that um, to, to find better ways of building resilience. Thank you. Yeah, so for, for me, resilience is about um, um, learning from the past, locally and abroad, constructing the evidence base using science and and education uh, and technology looking ahead and seeking to get the best forecast around uh, what might be what is likely uh, and what that then means for adaptation. And I think it's the old Darwinian proverb of, or, or, or narrative that says, um, 
you know, uh, survival of the species is not about the uh, the biggest or the or the smartest. It's about the one that's most able to uh, anticipate and adapt to its changing environment. Uh, and whatever that is, built environment, um, uh, demography, climate change, they are all fundamental to how we build and shape resilience going forward. Oh dear, I think I'm the last one. Um, for me, resilience is not an individual endeavour. It's a community endeavour. And I think it was the very, very smart man, Daniel Kahneman. Some of you might have read his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. I think he might be the person that points out that a lot of our thinking isn't good for us as individuals, but it's good for us as a species. And I think in terms of resilience, coming together as community and acknowledging we'll have to give a little to get a lot collectively is probably what we have to think a bit more about. I think that's very well said and what a wonderful way to wrap up our panel discussion. Uh, please thank our panellists. To conclude uh, the event tonight, I would like to introduce the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Professor Mark Hoffman, uh, who is going to give a vote of thanks to our guest here uh, this evening, the Commissioner. As probably everyone in this room knows, uh, Professor Hoffman is the University of Newcastle's uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, academic, and joined us uh, just last year in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and he's a leading materials scientist and engineer, specialising in the structural integrity of composites and biologic materials. Welcome. So it's my pleasure to give a, a vote of thanks, um, firstly to the audience um, for, for participating in great questions, but also um, very much to our panellists. Um, Lord Mayor, Councillor Nuatali Wilms, thank you very much for your leadership. Thank you, of course, for your engagement with this event. You engage very much with the university and we really, much, really appreciate it. And we had about 400 community members here tonight um, who've benefited from tonight's discussion, um, both here and online. Um, Willow Forsyth, what a great advertisement for the university as a PhD student. Thank you very much. Um, your insights, both from your professional career and also from your study, bring that, bring that partnership piece together really nicely and thank you very much. Of course, I'd also like to acknowledge my um, colleague, um, Professor Sue Ann Ware, who was very complimentary to me and said there's nothing wrong with engineers. Um, <laughs> but for curating an event such as um, the Building Resilience Exhibition, which is now in its fifth year and just down the road, um, upon which this lecture was, was built, I think we're very, um, we're very proud of the work that's done in cur cur curating that exhibition, but also your work at the university. This is, um, I've got the, the task of summing up. I always find this, this quite interesting. People talk for an hour and a half and I get a couple of minutes to sum up right at the end of it. Um, the first thing that struck me is sort of, uh, the topic was building resilience. So I thought, well, I'd better just sort of work out. And I couldn't quite work out if it was essentially about the resilience of buildings. We had an architect and built environment person working on it. Or about the building of resilience overall. And what came out of today, the, this evening's discussion, I think, was the intention was to do, actually do both. So it wasn't to confuse me or you, it was to basically try, try and cover both. And then we start thinking, well, what's resilience? And Shane said that when he started this role, he made the observation that everybody has a view on resilience. I have to say, Shane, that when you're in a university environment, everybody has a view on everything. Um, and they're very willing to express it and talk about it for a long time. So after you've had that experience, maybe you should think about moving to a university. It was great preparation for that. The interesting part about it then is I, I came down that there were essentially three themes that came out of building resilience. The first part is to prepare. Now, that's not easily done because, and I think Willow pointed it out, that we really need to educate people around something they've never seen nor felt in large part. And that's very much the role of universities. 
Um, and we try to do that a lot at the university. We put the content into courses, and, and Willow took one of those courses, which I think was a part of what motivated to continue on in this work. But it's a core priority to actually provide, of the university, to provide access to learning which most impacts our region and where we can have an area of influence. So this idea of educating resilience is something that's particularly important in what we do. And I think we have to do it through partnership. And I think what's wonderful about these events is, is the partnership that's actually, we're here in City Hall, it shows a wonderful partnership between the university and the, and the whole city of Newcastle. But also we have people such as Shane, who I think is, and I'll talk more about this, is essentially providing us such a, such a star and a sort of a light to, to move forward in what actually partnership is all about. Because that comes to the next part of, I suppose, building resilience and, and how do we educate people. Because the point was made that people, you can talk about people, talk, to, talk about resilience, and I think you gave uh, some interesting examples of sort of educating people who've got housing in floodplains. But it doesn't actually seem to work until you can actually get them to personalise it. And there was a wonderful example mentioned a couple of times that if you go to a community that has just had personal experience of a disaster, then they're quite prepared for it. But you go to a community in a similar area that hasn't had the personal experience and they're far less prepared for it. And that essentially means that this whole partnering piece becomes so important because we then have to have essentially the lived experience and we need to then engage more and more people with the lived experience to actually achieve this. Now, Willow made the point, and I, I, I'll have to paraphrase because I don't know if I get every word down, but she said that sort of the talking about risk can actually be very uncomfortable for people who've lived the experience. And Shane alluded to this as well. People sort of struggle to talk about it. But we've also got to talk about it in a way which is not excessive, not emotional, which means that it needs to be very evidence-based. And that sort of brings us back around to what universities are all about. And that's actually essentially putting together evidence-based discourse. And that's why I think events such as the Looking Ahead series are so good, because what we've had here this evening is an evidence-based discourse on a really important issue. But of course, to actually create this, I suppose, lived experience, it actually shows that it's, it's a community effort. You can't, to build this, this, I suppose, this lived experience, the community needs to come together. And I've often taken a view sort of in, in leadership so roles that I've had that you don't worry too much about everything else. It's people, people, people to make things work. But I think what tonight has also done is it's added an extra word to that because it's people, 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 partnership. And I think that's sort of the message that we need to get out of, out of today's, this evening's lecture, is building resilience is all about the people. We can do the infrastructure, but the people need to really feel it and understand it. And that comes through partnership. Now, the person I think who's given us the best example and essentially leading us in this um, is Commissioner Fitzsimmons, Fitzsimmons. Shane from Resilience, I think you, you, you called yourself. You, over many years, not just in your current role, but over many years, essentially typify community leadership and your dedication to the betterment of our state and particularly our regions, and we, we really feel that here in Newcastle, is about building our resilience in local, regional, uh, on local, regional and ultimately around global challenges. Now, we're really pleased to see you here tonight, um, Commissioner, because your presence at the University Series events provides us with the reassurance that we have a strong voice in the state government that hears, acts and leads on issues that are not only building resilience but are strengthening our communities. Now, um, Commissioner alluded to this because there was a reason that the agency was titled Resilience New South Wales, um, obviously one that um, the Commissioner had a fast learning curve on rather than disaster New South Wales or something similar, because it's our capacity as communities to look ahead, pick ourselves up when we get knocked down, and be grateful for what we have. We've had the 219 bushfires, the 2020 global pandemic, and the recent New South Wales floods. And the point was made that people come out of these with this learned experience and improved. And this is sort of, it reminded me of a presentation I gave to recently graduating students last Friday. And I said to them, 
you've come through, you've actually had to study through incredible change in the middle of a um, pandemic, move to home, having had a face-to-face -face learning experience. And for some of you that has been, or well, for most of us, most of you, that has been very challenging. But just think that there is no other graduating class, and this is what I said to them, that has built the resilience that you have through that experience. And that has actually placed you in a better position than any graduates ever um, in, in before you. Because this is something that I think is so much important, is building this experience and this resilience. And Shane really alluded us to this. I just want to say thank you. Um, you've led us as a state through a lot in three years. Um, and I just want to say for your guidance and presence in all of these events and, of course, your time tonight, thank you very much. We now have a, um, a gift for you, Shane. So if you would mind coming up on, on stage. I was going to leap down, but I didn't want to test the resilience of the, um, the platform there below. Um, so let's... Do... So thank you very much, Shane. We have a piece of Indigenous art which, from our gallery, which is one of Australia's most, most prestigious Indigenous galleries. And thank you very much for thank your... You. Thank you. And uh, as a good New South Wales public servant, this will be on my gift and benefits register. I don't need to be channeled to ICAC. Thank you very much. No, we just want it on your, your office wall next time you're interviewed behind you. <laughs> With the University of Newcastle written in front of it, please. Um, listen, thank you very much, everyone, for participating in tonight's event, for your questions, for your attendance, and I hope you had an enjoyable evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.